there's a really good publication. It's a magazine put out by, it's called the Objective Standard, and it is part of the Ayn Rand Group and the Ayn Rand Institute. And every now and then, they put out an article on education, and I tend to um, find problems with it because they usually treat John Dewey as some kind of boogeyman, and his, he's an evil genius, and he's, he's the one who designed the public schools, and he's the one that's, uh, he's the reason the public schools are corrupted and, and uh, insi- an insidious process that socializes the students. And, but it's really an inaccurate view of what the public schools are. And so just very recently, what's called The Objective Standard, a magazine, created another article on the progressive movement. And the progressive movement is much larger than John Dewey, and it began before John Dewey. And I wanted to do a quick audio recording because I wrote a long Facebook post on it, and I also thought maybe I'll just uh, record it as well. John Dewey, who was writing in the very early 20th century, by this time the public school system, in the, this is in the United States of course, the public school system is already running. The public school system, you can argue, began really in the in the mid nineteenth century, and a little bit earlier than that. The first pub, uh, first common schools, I think, were in some of the states in the eighteen thirties and forties, I believe. So, a public school, a quote free and compulsory, as Horace Mann, who is really the architect of the of the public school system, that's his quote, free and compulsory. The reason that the schools are how they are today, the public schools is more because of Horace Mann than John Dewey. And what the Objective Standard article article tries to argue here is that a single philosophy, and that is John Dewey and his progressivism, is the reason for the public schools today and how they operate. But that's simply not the case. A greater influence is what is sometimes called institutionalism. And that means that the public schools and how they operate is in an environment in which they're a public institution. It's not as if, a very easy way of understanding this is contrasting it with a private school. If you run a school out of your house, you control almost every aspect of that. You control who your students are. You control your curriculum. You can decide whether you want to abide by certain school board requirements, but otherwise you control almost everything to do with your school. It's your school. But the public schools, it's a public institution. It is controlled by no one person. It is controlled by a board of people, boards of education, uh, state boards of education, faculties of education, teachers unions, special interest groups, parents groups, industry often. There's all kinds of influences that go into fashioning together the Frankenstein that is the public schools. And yet, the Objective Standard, this magazine, which has a lot of good stuff in it, obviously I'm I'm a big fan of Ayn Rand, uh, but it always demonizes John Dewey or something that apparently operates the public schools, and it's just not the case. The public schools are a public institution, and all public institutions, many interests in forming its policies are not going to be able to operate on a single insidious or evil direction or goals. The public schools have, it cannot possibly handle such a task. The public schools are a, a machine of parts welded together in the wrong places. It's a, like I said, it's a kind of Frankenstein. It is a patchwork of interest groups that don't cooperate and don't want to cooperate and you put your student you put your children through that that's what it really is if you consider the the image of you have a an open canvas a blank canvas and 10 people with their various colors of brushes uh, are there and they all want to contribute to this painting all of them have their own different visions of what the uh, the painting ought to be and we, uh, but no, instead, it's actually one evil genius, John Dewey, who's running the public schools. It's just, it's just not the case. But let me read what I wrote. I'll read some of what I wrote, which will also add a bit of what I've just said off the cuff. 
So I said, um, it's not, it, I don't think it's fair to place Dewey nor philosophy as the sole designer of American public schools. Far more important was the institutional tone set by man, sealed by Parker. That's Francis Parker. He was also a contemporary of Horace Mann. He is actually called the father of progressivism. He was a colonel in some war for the United States. He was a hero. And he, after he retired as a colonel, he um, wrote and taught in, educa in schools. And he, like I said, he was also part of this movement. And he is usually the person cited as the person who gave, gave the character of the schools if and the structure would be Horace Mann who was the one who he argued for a a free and compulsory public school system that begins with Horace Mann and then later Parker not much later Parker is the one who began the culture of teaching a lot of teachers knew who he was in that time and he was a hero so both of those were before John Dewey and then John Dewey comes along in the early 20th century like this has already been almost a hundred years and then John Dewey comes on but apparently John Dewey is the evil genius behind it all uh, let me continue so it is not possible to identify a single philosophy within an institution like the public schools surrounded by political eclecticism and special interest groups pulling at it to accomplish goals which some do incoherence Dewey did war on the philosophical level against the orthodox parochial or traditional grad grind grammar school so let me maybe let me talk about what i just said there so of course parochial means religious so the schools as they were in the 19th century were called grammar schools at least the secondary schools were called that and those were the schools where they taught usually the trivium logic grammar and rhetoric a very classical education and a very good education i, sh I should say if you Try to look up look up some old grammar books. I think you'd be very surprised about the literacy rate, the the difficulty of of acquiring literacy in those days. It was very difficult. The grammar books we have today, we don't actually. I think grammar is not even taught anymore. The grammar is not even used in, as a subject anymore in schools. Now it's just called English. <laughs> so it, I think even that says a, a great deal. Just compare that with what's the same age level of, of kids from, from today and, and back then. So those are the grammar schools. Grad grind is a somewhat unfair but also in many ways correct caricature that, that Dickens made in it might have been the Nickleby one. It doesn't matter though. Look up Charles Dickens and Grad Grind, you'll find it. Grad grind was some teacher that was abusive to his students and getting them to memorize stuff or making fun of them or whatever. And it just it's a it's a phrase or it's a word used to, to mean the grammar schools of, of back then. So Dewey was warring against the past, so that was the traditional grad grind schools, and those schools were actually quite they survived into the early twentieth century. They survived even longer in Canada, up into the mid twentieth century. Uh, and then finally, pretty much just a little bit after World War II, they were ended pretty much, and the high schools began. High schools took over. That's a whole other topic, um, actually. The common schools and the, and the grammar schools were what used to be the two schools. Common schools were compulsory up to a certain age. Uh, not the grammar schools. Grammar schools were private, uh, in a sense. You had to pay usually to go. And then later on, as uh, this is Horace Mann's time, they wanted to keep increasing the compulsory age. So eventually they, they didn't take them over, but they essentially outcompeted the grammar schools. The grammar schools closed due to lack of funds, or they certainly the rural grammar schools couldn't exist anymore. But some of the inner city ones could survive because there was enough people. Like Toronto, for example, grammar school survived. And of course, they still survive, which is the interesting thing. The next school created to, to replace them was the high schools, and then the compulsory age kept increasing to, fee to fuel the high schools. To make them compulsory, they also had to reduce the standards. That's another reason why the grammar schools collapsed, is they reduced the standards to then make the high schools. The high schools were always of lower standard than the grammar schools, and that's still today again. That's still the same today. The private private schools are, are usually of higher quality than high schools, public high schools. The public stuff is always tends to be of lower quality. And then, of course, the common schools were removed and the elementary schools created. And now you have a system, elementary schools, high schools. And some people are even saying that colleges are getting degraded now and eventually may become compulsory themselves as, if the government keeps taking them over. In Ontario, for example, I think it's next year, our provincial government has made colleges free if you make if your parents make under a certain amount of money 
And of course, these comes with strings, so they're going to start regulating the programs that can be offered that can be made free. So many people think that the next step will be to make a certain number of years in college also compulsory, which is interesting. Well, this is what happened in history. The common schools were taken over and turned into elementary schools. The grammar schools were outcompeted, and then high schools were made, and compulsory age kept raising, and they're going to raise it again for the college. It's kind of funny. It just, history just carries on. Okay, so, the, so those are the traditional schools, and Dewey was also warring against the new Rousseauian progressives, or the child-centered movement. So you can see these in the, there's a child-centered movement that began in the early 20th century, uh, early education, um, we've heard of an um, early childhood educators. That movement began in the early 20th century and, and even started teacher training in that time. So it's a very old movement, actually. It's almost 100 years old. And these Rousseauian progressives were tended to be people. Everyone thinks that John Dewey was a progressive, and I, you could call him that if you want to. But really, the progressives were the Rousseauian types that didn't like institutions and wanted to keep their kids out of them. And you can even see some of this in um, the, the de-schooling movement. Um, Ivan Illich and later... Um, Ivan Illich and there was a bunch of them. And then later, of course, John Taylor Gatto, although he wouldn't call himself a, a Rousseauian. But that that's the other thing that was kind of going on. And, of course, John Dewey is often lumped together with them, but John Dewey also had problems with these Rousseauian progressives that... Uh, you know, Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French intellectual, said that uh, right at the beginning of his book on uh, Emile, a young boy who uh, is homeschooled, and it's right at the beginning of the book, he said something like, everything good for man comes from nature and everything bad for man comes from society. And so you can implicate many things from that kind of premise, right? Okay, so John Dewey was warring against that as well. So let me continue. But both of these were defeated by the institutional goals of maintaining an education system, free and compulsory, as Mann famously said. I guess one of my main critiques about the article here, the article saying that John Dewey is an evil mastermind behind the American public school system, is that actually the American public school system was had never had a philosophy. It was actually created for institutional reasons. They wanted to create an education system supported by the public that was able to be amended and distorted and morphed by the, the, each political, each new political agenda, each new, each new president, and also a public school system that was that could be altered by various special interest groups like teachers' unions and all of that. So that's what really this is about. This isn't a philosophy. It's very, you really, like I said earlier, to control something enough to actually run a philosophy, it's got to be a private school of some kind. You can't expect to run a behemoth uh, with a single philosophy, and especially when you're, you're at the controls, but so are nine other people. Like, it's just not possible. So let me continue. The article forgets that Dewey was a pragmatist. He was trying to balance out these two forces. In fact, he, be, he bemoans his, his poor influence in this war in a late, short work, experience in education. Why? Because a single philosophy has never driven this institution. So I actually taught this. I used this book in a text for a textbook, and of course I taught because I thought it was excellent. Because in this little book by John Dewey, it's like probably about eighty pages. If you're ever interested to get a taste of John Dewey in a in a very fair way, I think it's a very good book as an introductory book to John Dewey. Because in this little tiny book, he wrote it in the late thirties, and he died in um, he died in fifty two or something like that, or the, or the early fifties, I believe, and. In many ways, I think, so John Dewey was getting very old then. I think he was in his 70s. And he, this, this book, this little book called Experience Education, is basically John Dewey kind of reflecting on his work. And he essentially complains that he hasn't, he's failed in his task to create what he thinks is a better educational philosophy out of the old traditional schools, grammar schools, and the crazy hippie-ish Rousseau progressive schools, or non-schools as you might even call them. And he complains that he just has failed to reach both. And too often, either he is compared to, uh, like often the traditionalists compare him to just a, another progressive, or the um, Rousseau types also won't listen to him, won't consider that he might have a better view on the on the subject than than them. So it's a very nice little book if you're ever interested in just a taste of John Dewey. Uh, just It's called Experience Education. Okay, so I'll continue. No doubt Montessori was a competitive contemporary 
So let me just stop for a second there. Montessori and John Dewey were born in the same year, but Dewey, Dewey lived a bit longer, lived almost 20 years longer, I think. And so they were contemporaries. And Montessori is not talked about very often in academic literature, which I have, wrote, I have published in. And it's very unfortunate, and I think the reason why is that John Dewey was, was a professor. He was part of the, the establishment, you might say. He actually was also an instructor at Teachers College at Columbia, which Teachers College at Columbia, it's named itself Teachers College. It's kind of funny. There's lots of Teachers Colleges in the world, right? But the one at Columbia, they just named themselves Teachers College. They capitalized both letters, of both verse to both of the words, and made themselves, you know, the prominent, uh, and they are the most prominent Teachers College. They are the most influential. And John Dewey worked there, so in part it's because, of, of course, him, him working there. And because of that, and John Dewey did world tours, I think you might, you might know he went to China, and did a, fun, a bunch of lectures, and I'm sure he was yet. I'm sure he's been to Europe. But the interesting th- thing is, so did Montessori. Montessori traveled the world. There were all kinds of people interested in her philosophy. She did talks all over the place. Um, of course, we all always hear, just like you know, when you when you hear about the American founding fathers, everyone always says, "Oh, but they owned slaves." Oh, so that means we just we just delete them from history, and we don't need to study. We don't need to care about Thomas Jefferson. He had slaves, right? Ah, oh, well, hell with them, right? The same thing happens in Montessori. They say, oh, but didn't uh, Mussolini advocate for her schools or something like that? It's like, oh, so that means, I guess, you know, Montessori is useless. We just just throw her out. Well, isn't it arguable that Montessori has had a greater influence than John Dewey in some respects, and certainly in the private school world? What's the most popular secular private school in the world? It's very likely Montessori. There is no John Dewey private school movement, and it doesn't exist. He was part of the state school, public school hero um, institutional hero, an establishment hero, whereas Montessori was a grassroots hero, a private school hero. So they both did world tours. Who is more influential? It's an interesting question. I don't know how you would measure it, though. Uh, maybe you could look at how many times Montessori's Googled versus how many times John Dewey's Googled. That, I don't know. That might be an indication of something. But If you want a very good lecture series on different philosophies of education, I must recommend Stephen Hicks. You can just Google him. And that's Hicks, H-I-C-K-S. He has a fantastic lecture series that does everyone. It does the idealists. It does Aristotelians. It does the um, the pragmatists, which is John Dewey. It does existentialists. And it does Ayn Rand at the end. It does objectivists at the end. It's fantastic. It's a very good lecture series. All on YouTube. And also he's got a website that you can look up. Um, so... So the problem, this problem afflicting public schools should be obvious and equally obvious why it doesn't afflict Montessori private schools, which are free to run themselves based on a single philosophy. So that's one of the main arguments I'm making in this piece here against this article is that the public schools are not able to run by a single philosophy. They're, like I said, they're a behemoth with 10 people at the controls, right? But a Montessori school... And by the way, I should mention that Montessori is not copyrighted. Anyone can make a Montessori school. There are associations. There is the um, International Montessori Society, IMS. I think it's IMS, or it's, maybe it's Association IMA. I can't remember. And there's an American Montessori Society or Association. So AMS or AMA. I'm not sure what, what, the, um, what the last word is there. But you don't have, anyone can start a Montessori school. So that's something to know because... If you ever wanted to send a kid to a Montessori school, you have to do somewhat of your own vetting because there is no, there's no standards, there's no international body that regulates them. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that you have to do your homework and you have to know what you're getting into and you have to make sure that this teacher knows what they're doing and stuff. But my argument, my main argument in this piece here against this article is that if you run your own private school, as Montessori schools are, they're not regulated by anybody, then you are able to run a philosophy. You are able to do. You could make, if you wanted to, you could try to operate a school run by the evil genius of John Dewey, as the article here likes to point, likes to believe that the public schools are run by John Dewey. Um, you could run a, a school, and actually, when John Dewey was alive, there was a laboratory school, as, as they were called, which is a little insidious, but that's what they were called. Uh, there was a laboratory school, I think it was in Chicago, 
that ran on John Dewey's philosophy, but it didn't last. So again, you know, who was more influential, Montessori or John Dewey? Is an interesting question. Yeah, so Montessori schools are free to run themselves based on a single philosophy. I'm not sure why objectivists believe a single man and his philosophy leads an entire institution. I have no idea why that's why they think that. And perhaps we should be thankful Dewey was not that influential. However, setting up Dewey as a boogeyman is unhelpful. Parents who are informed about the public schools are wary of the chaos and do not send their children there. And I put that last little sentence in there because I just, like if your audience is, you're trying to change parents' minds about the public schools, realize that people who are already informed of the public schools are sending their kids there anyways. So you're not, you know, you're not changing anyone's minds um, by, and then I also, the second last sentence there about Dewey and a boogeyman, I just, I think that's what they're doing. They're, they're creating a caricature here. And objectivists don't like when Ayn Rand is caricatured. She's seen as some, like, right-wing evil person who wants the poor to starve in the streets or something like that. Right? We don't like it when Ayn Rand is caricatured. We don't like when there's anti-intellectualism going on with ideas. But uh, we'll, we don't, for some reason, it seems that the magazine, the Objective Standard, and their various articles on John Dewey, they often do that. They'll often caricature John Dewey as the manufacturer of the American public school system, and it's surely not the case. There is a very good article that Ayn Rand wrote called The Compra Chicos, and I believe it's in um, Return to the Primitive, I think. And in that book, I believe, is her article called The Camper Chicos, and it's actually a very good article. It does talk about John Dewey, but I do not believe she suggests that John Dewey is running the public schools. She just talks about his philosophy, and that's valid. And the Camper Chicos, it's a good metaphor she sets up. She says that it's there's some Spanish phrase about Camper Chicos or some kind of like, some kind of mythological thing of people. I don't know if it's true or not. It would be very awful if it was true. Some like myth about people who, who put little kids inside of vases so that when they grew, eventually they would they would grow big enough that they'd be they'd be against the sides of the vase and they couldn't grow anymore and it would warp their, you know how Japanese women will will wrap their feet. It's, I don't know if it's still done, but they used to wrap their feet up so then and their feet would be very tiny. They wouldn't grow because they were wrapped up. The same kind of thing was in these vases, these kids born in these vases, and eventually they would grow to the size of the vases and couldn't grow anymore, and then they would be all distorted and warped. What her metaphor is, is that people, the schools are doing that to kids' minds, which is a very interesting critique, and very much complementary to the Montessori approach, because the Montessori approach was viewed by her, and Montessori of course, as not being a vase on people's minds. It was a way, it was a philosophy of the mind to grasp reality as it ought to and not being tied down like in a vase like the metaphor is so if you're interested in in philosophy of education and ayn rand's take you probably can get it online the, the article called the compra chicos and oh my god i don't think i better spell it for you but uh if you google it like spell it out as best you can the google will probably help you out there um all right so this is just my quick i guess not very quick is it on philosophy of education and some of the distortions in the you know, you don't. There's this idea about being a purist and an ideologue, but I think that's a wrong view. If we were a purist about Aristotle, we would never make any progress because while Aristotle had much to say that was good, he made mistakes, and there's actually parts of Aristotle that are Platonist. I don't remember who now. There was someone who was trying to write a book to correct Aristotle's mistakes and create pure Arist Aristotelianism. Well, that would, be fa that would be very interesting if someone could do that. But we can't take a thinker as an ideologue, and we can't, we can't expect every thinker to, to write on everything and, and not to make mistakes. And I don't think if we, if we did that to Aristotle, we'd be at a disadvantage. And if we did that for Ayn Rand, we'd be at a disadvantage. So and if we do that for anybody else, we did that to John Dewey, we're at a disadvantage as well. Um, John Dewey had some good things to say and some not so good things to say or, or incorrect things to say. I think I think it's you. You can certainly argue against John Dewey. Yeah, that's 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 not difficult. Uh, but to just throw him out as a boogeyman and everything he said was wrong and he's the evil genius behind the public school system is just you know, not helpful to the future here. It's not educational to just create boogeymen. And progress demands that we find, we identify, we find uh, tools to identify the best in all thinkers, the, what we actually can, can graph that is workable and right. 
Someone like Foucault or Derrida may be very difficult to find something that's correct or, or even coherent. John Dewey, it's not difficult. There's things that they said that were right, and many people listening to this might say that Rand is even easier, uh, but surely we can, uh, progress must be ours, and we need to put things in our own words, and we need to go forward with the right ideas wherever we may find them.